Greetings from Atlanta, home of Coca-Cola, the unmatchable, unique drink that's been a symbol of the good life since the year 1886. We'll come back to that Coke bottle a little bit later on. For now, let's begin I Faith Sermon number 36, Don't Work, Don't Eat. We recently finished several messages on the Second Coming from the Thessalonian letters. Paul responded to their issues, their confusion, and now there's another. And we read about uh, what's going on in 2 Thessalonians 2 too. Apparently, someone is saying that Paul was teaching something he didn't teach. Listen. He urges them not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a prophecy or a spoken word or a letter supposedly from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Paul, Paul never taught that. Of course, the Lord came, and the last days began at Pentecost, and we're in the final era of human history. But Jesus' second coming is still future. But there's a group here in Thessalonica who are confused. And Paul says that they're idle, as we're going to see. The confusion has a certain consequence. So often wrong ideas have an impact on us. Uh, it's not just an intellectual point. Because of these people's view about the day of the Lord, they were disengaged. They were idle. Listen to this. We're in now our main text, which is in 2 Thessalonians 3. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. Paul is referring back to his initial time as he planted the church, as he preached the gospel in Thessalonica, and this is in Acts chapter 17. Now, his example then uh, of planting the church, working hard, insisting on paying people for their help rather than insisting on being paid, it's so different in spirit to the attitude of these confused people who are saying the day of the Lord's already come. They're idle. So they are idle, they're not working hard. And when you know they say idle hands, devil's workshop, we do need to be busy. Not busy bodies, but we should be busy. And Paul warns the church. When people are idle, it's hard to get them going again. You know, if people are already going, you can make course corrections. But when there's inertia, uh, it's very hard to overcome that. I remember uh, a brother said, when I was a young Christian, uh, he said something to this effect. It's far easier to redirect something in motion than to overcome the inertia of a blob. That's the brother or sister who just sits there and is not doing anything for God. We need to be doing something. Hopefully we're going in the right direction. But Paul knows how dangerous it can be to the church if these people are idle. And so he warns them, but he also models the kind of life they should live, just as he did when he planted the church. Let me say something about Paul's work ethic. He was an evangelist, that is, a church planter. Um, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7, we read that some people criticized Paul because he didn't take a regular salary. He had the right to it, and he insists on that. He says those who work for the church should be supported by the church. 1 Timothy 5, 17, 18. It's okay for the elders to be paid. He had the right, but he did not insist on it. Now, you may know preachers who are paid by the church completely or partly, or maybe not at all. Um, if we read the book of Acts honestly and look at the letters, look at the epistles, I think you'll see that um, the career preacher, that description is a little hard to find in the New Testament. And so why did Paul teach and live this model? That's what we're going to be looking at. It's a model that would be roundly rejected in most denominations today. But see, Paul didn't want to take advantage of anybody. So unlike 
the prosperity preachers who want to be rich and they dare to say, give to my ministry and God will make you rich. Paul didn't take advantage of people. Now he insists on that back in 1 Thessalonians 2, comparing himself to a mother, to a father. He would no more take advantage of the Thessalonians than a, a mother or father would take advantage of a child. We're not looking for benefit. We're not looking for them to give us something. We just want to give to them. And that's the nature of love. That's the, the nature of the right kind of pastoral ministry. By insisting on working and paying his own way, so to speak, Paul undermines his critics, those who would say, well, whatever they want to say, that he's taking advantage of the people because he's clearly not. Now, the false teachers demanded payment, but Paul didn't. And the most you see in the New Testament is sometimes he's supported partly, fully, or not at all, Sometimes he has to be supported by a different church, or he just has to go into his regular business. And he had a, a skill, he had a business, and he supported himself. It's not that it would be wrong to take support from others. Jesus took support from others, Luke 8, verse 3. As I said, Paul argued that the elders have a right to payment and don't muzzle the ox when it's treading out the grain. But Paul really doesn't want to use that right. He feels he has more influence, more leverage, when he's beyond any uh, criticism of financial mismanagement or exploitation, read 1 Corinthians 9 for more. And I always wondered, what do we do to our churches if our leaders were not paid, or at least if the expensive denominational model were, were uh, scaled back, and, and then people's jobs didn't depend so much on pleasing the audience with what they say? Easy for me to see. I mean, I was on staff for 20 years raising my own support for two years, 18 years paid. But I do think they have to be careful because money in, in faith matters as well as in politics and really any realm uh, can easily hinder genuine reform. Money can warp motives. This isn't the point of the message, but I want us to think about Paul's work ethic and why in, in various letters he points out that he preferred not to owe anyone anything. He was a gracious recipient, but he was also very gracious in supporting himself. Let's continue. So we're back in 2 Thessalonians 3, and now we're up to verse 10. For even when we were with you, pointing back to Acts 17, right, the planning of the church, even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Well, in modern Western society, don't work, don't eat may sound very un uncompassionate. Well, shouldn't we feed people even if they don't work? Are we saying there should be no benefits, no welfare? That's not what I'm saying. And Paul was not creating an absolute law. In fact, in the very next letter in the New Testament, 1, Thessalonians, uh, 1 Timothy 5, we read what? About support for widows, not the younger widows who can still be highly productive and don't need that support and can remarry, but the older widows who would actually be supported by the church from church funds. They would be supported. So there you are. Uh, Paul's not creating an absolute law. Um, he's totally fine with people being helped by the church. But his focus is on the heart, and that means we've got to look at one's willingness to work. Are we willing to work? Or are we always looking for a break, stretching the lunch hour, showing up late to work, leaving early, uh, playing computer games when our boss actually is paying us to do something else? That's that willingness to work. And it shows in little things and in one's general attitude. With Paul, there's no sense of entitlement. He genuinely wants to help. And he distinguishes the busy person and the busy body. Of course, busy bodies and busy persons, they all think that they're busy. They all think they've got a lot to do. But if we're looking at the productivity, we're looking at the impact, we can see that one is self-deceived. Those who did not want to work still managed to do things, to get around. They filled their daylight hours with something, but it was not pleasing to the Lord. In another letter, Paul talks about busy bodies who go from house to house. So they're very social. 
uh, gossiping and I guess they might call it fellowship, but what's the impact? Oh, so let's talk about that bottle. Growing up, I heard lots of jingles, lots of tunes, songs, uh, even very short advertisements about Coca-Cola. Uh, that was on television. But Coke has been advertised since the 1800s, since 1886. If you're older, you may remember these. I'd like to teach the world to sing. It's the most popular jingle. It's the real thing. Coke is it. Coke and a smile. Now <laughs> we could say more. But is this really the real thing? People want the good life. Paul warns us that those who are idle, he warns that they're actually dead. In 1 Timothy 5, 6, he says, the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. It's not just a widow, it's anybody. We live for pleasure, we're dead even while we're alive. We're not really alive, and we're not pleasing God. Is this the real thing? There is a real thing. It's a living water that Jesus Christ offers, and we need to be careful because we're supposed to live for him, and it's so easy to rationalize wasting time, unemployment, underemployment, various forms of being busy but really being busy bodies, and we can find spiritual reasons for that. And I'm not saying, please don't mishear me. I'm not saying that if you're currently unemployed, that you're, you're evil and you're in trouble. But we want to be productive. Even if we were unemployed, we should still be busy, but busy in the right kinds of ways. Paul talks about working quietly. What does that mean? He says, do the work quietly and earn their own living. I think it means we're not calling attention to ourselves. We're not being unnecessarily disruptive or boisterous. We're good citizens. We're good family members and workers. And as much as possible, we don't want to be dependent on others. We are meant to carry our weight. Paul's final thoughts on this follow. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person. And have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Paul asks the brothers and sisters to hold each other accountable. It's a light form of church discipline, right? It, this is something that maintains morale, and it's important. Now, he's, he never says that the idle are non-Christians. He doesn't say if you're lazy or you're disengaged that your salvation is on the line and you're, or you're lost now. But obviously, there is a spiritual danger. Entitlement and laziness and unhealthy dependence, what do they do? They erode the morale of the church. It's hard to feel proud when you have a lot of people not really doing anything. They compromise the church's witness to the watching world, and they damage unity, and they stifle growth. Let me repeat this. Entitlement, laziness, and unhealthy dependence have some very negative impacts. They erode the morale of the church. They compromise our witness to the watching world. They damage our unity, and they stifle growth. We're to affect change. I want to be like Paul. I want to inspire others to reject selfish living and laziness. And we can't just do that by telling people, hey, get going. Much better simply to lead the way through our personal example. Jesus Christ, of course, was very similar. He led the way. Yes, he taught, but he always showed people what he was expecting. And so that's the message for today. Don't work, don't eat. I didn't say that. That's the Apostle Paul. Study that passage. That key passage was 2 Thessalonians 3.10. And let's let it make a difference in our lives. What's coming up next in our I Faith series, the next four sermons are from the Corinthian letters. I'm very eager to uh, preach those. But for now, let's make the change. Let's learn the lesson God bless you all.